Hello, and welcome to a, our live Q&A with Marina Litvinenko and Anthony Bolton. I'm Wasfi Carney and I started Grange Park Opera in 1998. Uh, we built the theatre in the woods about three years ago in Surrey, not very long ago, and around the same time, Anthony Bolton asked me a question, but more on that soon. I'm very honoured to be working with Tony and Marina on the new opera. So Alexander Litvinenko, known as Sasha, he died 15 years ago in November 2006. Everyone knows the devastating picture of him in hospital, an excruciating death. It was a direct hit on British soil, which was until then kind of unthinkable. And it just takes one millionth of a gram of polonium-210 to kill someone. Anthony Bolton is a genius fund manager and he's best known for fidelity. He's also uh, A, unbelievably modest and B, a very serious musician. Marina is an, ast an uh, astounding person who's conducted herself with astounding dignity through this whole thing. I was very touched when I read a statement that she'd made shortly after her husband had died. She said, Sasha wasn't just my husband. He was my soulmate, he motivated me, and he made me feel protected. Marina's an accomplished dancer, and she'll tell you later about her hula hoop. But first, Marina, how did you meet Anthony? Uh, very good evening to everybody. Uh, Wasfi, thank you very much for doing this for me, for Sasha's memory, and I think it's a great project. It's the first time for me when I need to talk about opera, and it's quite an unusual experience because uh, I did a lot of interview for documentary or even for movie, but opera, it's something very unusual. And it was exactly when it, I heard first time uh, about this project. I didn't uh, met uh, Anthony Bolton yet, but I heard about this project and I was just thinking, hmm, really strange uh what what how is it going to be and what's this about and i think it takes another maybe a year before we uh, finally met and it was very interesting uh when i met anthony i i immediately trust him and i realized what he will do it would be excellent because uh, he was very passionate. It was, again, it was difficult to understand is a, a person very successful in the financial world, suddenly decide to write music and opera. But uh, when Anthony explained to me why, I just, I just, what I said, I trust him immediately. And then Anthony, you explain, how did this idea come to you? You're meant to be working. <laughs> yeah, I was meant to be working. Um, so Sasha was poisoned in November 2006. And in March 2008, I actually bought an audio copy of Marina's biography about Sasha. Death of a Dissident, the poisoning of Alexander Lipanenko and the return of the KGB. I remember sitting in a car park in Chichester with this on in the car. I listened to a lot of uh, things in the car and I was completely taken this amazing story and I was very moved by it. And I just thought this is outrageous. And then as I finished it, I had this sort of flash. This has all the ingredients of opera, power, politics, betrayal, love, murder. And I thought, gosh, I've got to have a go at doing this. You know, this, this, this would make a, a fantastic opera. And that's where the whole idea came from. And then, but there's been a big gap between, I think you started <laughs> writing it in 2008. So yeah. So my original idea, my original intention was to have retired in 2000 and the end of 2009. And then I thought, well, I could start writing it. Um, I actually, in WorkWise, decided to go off and do something completely new. And, and Sarah, my wife and I moved to Hong Kong. And for four years, I ran a Chinese fund. So my music project had to go on the sidelines because I knew 
I couldn't do it while I was working. I, I could only do it when I retired. Actually, with hindsight, that was no bad thing because the big question, you know, I read Marina's biography. I read two or three other books about Sasha, but there was no, no, no one was sure about who murdered him. There were lots of theories, etc. In 2015 and 16, we had the public inquiry that Marina had gone on and on asking for and fin finally the politicians agreed to it. And, that, and there was a lot of information that came out then. And I think then that was once for all, once and for all, it said Andrei, Andrei Ligovoy was the murderer. And then I just want to go back a tiny bit. Marina, in your yes. own words, so we don't actually see this bit in the opera. Tell me about the, leaving Russia when you realized you had to leave Russia. Uh, I I did realize this only when I was already outside of Russia for kind of a holiday with my son because Sasha already knew we have to leave Russia in 2000, but I didn't know it's for sure. And when he asked me not to return to Russia, I was really surprised and shocked because I never had any plan to escape from Russia to live in another country. But uh, before that, Sasha spent almost one year in prison. He was released on bail, but uh, he said they will definitely will put him in prison again. And it doesn't matter, it would be a more successful uh, ending. And when only we decide not to return to Russia. And this was in 2000. And now when we're talking about Russia in 2021, we see how more people escaped from Russia, who not escaped, and who is in danger now. And, and when, when you arrived in England in 2000, you arrived at the airport, then what happened? First of all, uh, it was not our choice uh, to go to UK, uh, uh, how would we say, first choice. It wasn't first choice. Uh, no. It was just, it was just, no, it was not. It was uh, just escape from Russia without any plan where to go. And when it was discussion, uh, what is our destination? Uh, UK came to our mind only because we could travel without transit visa. And when we arrived to UK, uh, just to fly then after that to Russia, Sasha made this step and he approached policemen and said, I'm looking for political asylum. And you, and, and, and you had and your child was, with you. You had your small child with you. Anatoly was six years old. And of course, everything for me was to protect him. And decision uh, to travel was only with the guarantee uh, he will be OK. He will be OK. He will be with his father. And our family would be safe. I, I didn't think about any political action. I didn't think about any uh, what we're doing. I want to protect our family. And when we landed and when we waited for decision and when we were allowed to leave airport as a, a normal people to stay in accommodation, I felt so safe. And I would say it happened in 1st of November of 2000. And exactly 1st of November in 2006, Sasha was poisoned. Terrible. And the, the, your arrival isn't portrayed in the opera. Tony, tell me some of the bits that you have put together in the opera. So the, the opera, so it's in two acts of about an hour each. And the, the setting is partly in Russia, partly in the UK. And we have flash forwards and flashbacks and there's a lot of audio visual in, in the opera. Of course, you know, when, when you're doing an opera about someone's life, there's the question is what do you leave out because there's, there's a lot of material, but Marina already mentioned the prison, uh, that Sasha was in prison. The last scene of the first act is a scene in uh, Sasha's in prison and it's pretty desolate. And Marina, you come in to, to visit him and 
that it's while he's there that he suddenly realizes he can't stay in Russia any longer. He's, he's got to leave. Um, the, the, obviously, the, 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 the opera starts and ends with his deathbed uh, speech. And, uh, you know, I think that that's a very important part. But, but it, it really goes through a lot of the events in his life and the related uh, people like Boris Berezovsky, who became a sort of mentor when Sasha saved his life. Uh, Anna Poliskovskaya, the, the, the journalist who was extremely outspoken against the regime and eventually was murdered outside her flat on Putin's birthday. So they're all weaved into this story of Sasha's life. And, and this is a, it sounds a crazy thing to ask. Are there any comic moments? Yes, there's some comic, the, yeah, I mean, in such a tragedy, I mean, you, you need contrast. And probably the most comic scene is there's a scene with the, the killer, Lugavoy, bo boasting about it, the poison in his briefcase. And he's sort of laughing and he's been gone back to, to Russia and being given medals and he's medals and he's boasting about the medals he's been given. That's pretty comic. Well, you know, it, it's... It's comic, but it's extremely. Sad. And M Marina, you must have met um, Anna Politkovskaya many times. And just tell me a little bit about what she was like, please. Uh, first of all, I'm very grateful. Uh, Anna Politkovskaya is the main role in this opera because uh, is it's extraordinary woman. She was a very close friend to Sasha as much as they could, living in the different countries meeting occasionally but i know when anna came to uk they always uh, met each other she visited us in our house uh we went together uh, to visit in other places but uh she was uh, as a person who always keep a little bit distance she had her own space and she, for me, she was looked as a, as a queen, in a good way. And and and, Marina, did she have any sense that she might be bumped off? Oh, first of all, she worked in a very uh, dangerous material. Her uh, main subject was a Chechnya. Chechnya is a region in Russia was twice in a war, in a serious war. And she helped a very ordinary people who came to her with the questions to ask for advice. And all her reports were so honest and so special. And if you need somebody to take a charge, she would be the best person. And of course, for somebody, she was dangerous because she never lied. And this is uh, her uh, work. Maybe uh, was a very dangerous for her life. But Sasha, did did she ever say to you, "I'm I'm worried for my life that that um somebody's going to assassinate me"? She never said no. that. Might as well hear. No, no, no. She never told it to me, of course, because I I have I've, I've never been so close with her. But Sasha was very close, and he was very worried about her life, and particularly uh, just months before she was killed. And he said, uh, Anna, your life is dangerous. You might live in any other country. You can live in the United States, you can live in the UK, you can write your articles. It would be any way reading by people. But she said, no, I can't. It's not only to write articles, it was always to meet people. Because she had her place in the office of her newspaper. It was every day a queue of people waiting to see her, to talk to her. And she believed how it was important and why she never uh, left before. And so, so Anna has actually quite a significant role in the opera, Tony. Um, yes. To just, to, to just tell us who the other characters are. Yeah, yeah. So just Anna is in two big scenes. There was this theatre siege in, in 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 Moscow, which was made to look like terrorists but it was actually the kgb who did it and anna w went in to negotiate with the terrorists and then in the second uh, act of the opera there's a scene at muswell muswell hill which is your home marina 
uh, where she's talking about and that she saw that um, Sasha's picture was being used for target practice by the KGB. So the, the, other, the other characters in, in the opera are um, uh, the, 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 the killer that I've mentioned. The head of the KGB is, is one of the characters because Sasha had only one meeting with the head of the KGB and it's a sort of quite an important scene in the second act where he comes in and he says, look, sir, I can tell you all about the corruption going on in the KGB. And these are the bad guys and these are the good guys. And he gets basically gets the brush off. He says, you know, the head of the KGB says, thanks, Sasha. Um, I'll ring you when, I, when I'm ready. <laughs> Which of course never I'll be in happens. touch soon. Um, so so um, it, it must, it's very odd because when you're putting on an opera about people who exist, you know, we had to find someone who looked a little bit like Marina <laughs> and we had to find someone who looked a bit like Sasha. So it's a kind of, it's very strange. You know, if you, if you cast Violetta in Traviata, she can look like anything. But yeah. I had to find my Marina equivalent. And Marina, this must be very odd for you because there's been a play about about the story as well at the Royal Court and you sit in the audience and you see someone on the stage portraying you. What's that like? Yeah, you're absolutely right. It's very strange. Uh, first time when I realized it might be somebody is playing me uh, was in 2007 when it first was approaching to make a movie with uh, Michael Mann and uh, it was already discussion who might play me. I was really every time shocked because I knew in 2007 uh, uh, supporting this project, it was very important to keep attention to this case because nobody knew how it would be quickly escaped from uh, people's mind. But uh, I was supported, but uh, in a question who might play you, I was silent because I didn't know. And when it first time happened in this play you just mentioned, it was a I think it was a great play and it was a lot of uh, comic situation. It was a tragedy and comics we already discussed about this. It was a based on Luke Harding book, Very Expensive Poison and in a, the Old Vic Theater. I think it was great. And when I was first time, I couldn't watch to the stage because it was like a psycho. You see somebody talking like you, moving like you, talking to Sasha like we did, really. I was almost like this. I couldn't watch this first time. But uh, step by step, I, of course I cried from beginning in the middle and at the end, but uh, I watched it maybe all together four or five times. I always leave it again and again, but I so uh, pleased to Mayana, who was the actress playing this character because she was so accurate, so, uh, gentle and we became friends really if you could see a picture of us it looks like we're identical twins <laughs> really? Thank you. Really? yes but, but opera of course it's even more because i'm not only walking and talking i have to sing <laughs> <laughs> so yes, that will be very fun. I'm going to talk to Tony a little bit about his um, other compositional output. output. So I've known your music, Tony, since about 2000, 2001. And there are some, uh, yeah, I've been to some concerts and I've listened to your music. So t tell me about other things that you've written and what. what yeah, so, so let me, I mean, my musical history, I started to write music when when I was about nine or 10 years old at school. And I continued writing at school and university. And then to be honest, when I started work, I largely gave up. But my sons were choristers when they were young and their choir master heard that I wrote music. And he said, oh, well, why don't you write something for us? And that got me composing again. And he introduced me to the program Sibelius, a musical notation program. And that transformed composing for me because it allowed me to hear voices and instruments. Uh, it synthesizes the sounds of different instruments. So I started, I wrote uh, a set of carols modeled on Benjamin's uh, ceremony of carols. 
I then wrote each of, each of my, our, our children a married a, a wedding anthem for each of their uh, weddings. I wrote two song cycles, uh, one for tenor, one for soprano, and then a wind quintet, an octet. I wrote a piece for 16 individual players. And then the two, the sort of the biggest work I'd done before the opera was a large work called the Seven Wonders of the Ancient World, a little modeled on Holst's planets. So it had seven movements and each movement was one of the wonders of the ancient world. And you were kind enough to use one of them, I think in one of your videos about the building of the opera house. And then I, and then I've written another orchestral piece, the curfew garden. So, so that, that, that's the history. Shall I say a little, sorry, a little bit about the opera and the type of music? Yeah, so, so, so yeah. tell me, so when, when Tony and I first talked about this piece, and yes. lots of people come to me saying they've written an opera, and I think, oh no, I've got to reply to them. Anyway, his key, we were actually having a conversation, he mentioned he'd written this opera, I thought it sounds like quite a good idea, and I said, I want to listen to it, and I'll put it on if I think it's good, and I'm very fussy, and it is actually very good. <laughs> so, <laughs> Uh, I call you. a spade a spade. So to tell us a bit about the opera and tell us about all your compositional styles. Yeah. He's not a Yeah. So just a little bit more of the story. So when I told you about it, you introduced me to Stephen Metcalf, who's the director. And, and Stephen got very enthusiastic about the idea and had lots of um, ideas about the staging and what the scene should be. And then he introduced me to Kit Hesketh Harvey, who's written the libretto. Uh, which he's written a brilliant libretto, which rhymes in a lot of places, etc. And I sort of got down to writing in 2016 to 18. So I tried, it's contemporary, but, but it's traditional in a lot of ways, in the sense it has scenes, it has arias. Um, I hope the music I've written is lyrical. And it's got motives. So there's a motive for Sasha, there's a motive motive for the killer, Andre Lugavoy, there's a motive for polonium. And then there's a refrain um, that several characters say, what could be safer than an island? I think it was something you, Marina and Sasha said, you thought you'd come to the UK, you were on an island, you were safe. And so th th that appears three times and the music is the same. What I've interweaved with my music is some Russian music to, to give it the Russian flavor. So there's a Red Army marching song. There's a Moscow football anthem because when Lugovoy comes to London to murder Sasha, his cover was that he was coming to a football, uh, the Moscow team playing Arsenal at the Emirates Stadium. Um, the Chechen national anthem appears. And then I put in some quotes and some are obvious, but some are more he hidden. There's a, a few quotes from uh, Shostakovich symphonies. There's some quotes from the Rachmaninoff Vespers, but the key thing I've quoted is Tchaikovsky and his opera, Eugene and Yegin. And particularly the letter song, which appears sometimes very hidden, but at other times more obvious. Uh, the ballroom scene in, in that opera, I've actually used that and transformed it into Beres Borzowski's uh, birthday party at Blenheim Palace, which starts the second act. And, and initially about the first eight bars are Tchaikovsky. And then it sort of morphs into my music and the chorus. I haven't mentioned the chorus, there's a, there's a chorus and they are at different times, Russian citizens, Russian soldiers, prison inmates, Chechen Muslims, terrorists, football supporters, Terrorism. hotel bar occupants, and finally a cathedral choir. So they're pretty versatile, the old chorus. Um, I, I love, I particularly love the bits when you quote Eugene Onyegin, of course, because it's such a wonderful piece. And so I, I, I was very moved by it. So, you know, when you say, when you talk about disguising motifs inside your work, yes. you're sounding a bit like Robert Schumann. That's the kind of thing he did <laughs> with the Clara motif. Um, so is, is this, does this connect your investment finance mind with music? How, how do the two fit together? 
I've been trying WASPI for years to work out what the connection is, and I find it very difficult. I think there is a connection between investment and music, a sort of mathematical, the notation and music and that side. But other than that, to, to be honest, having racked my brain to find the connection, I haven't found it yet. Um, but I, I did lots of maths as well, and I love music. But ultimately, yeah. I suppose music, it either speak, you know, it speaks to you, and it, it you know, it, it, it informs your humanity. And I suppose it doesn't matter whether you're a, 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 a road sweeper or a I, Yes, I think that's right. I've always, I'm always somebody who, who nearly all the time has some sort of music going on in, in, in my head, you know, and even. I was sitting in a company meeting, listening to a company talk about their business, and I'm sort of my my head is humming some tune. Often it's my music and the music that I'm working on, and it, as you may hear, some composers say this. It almost at times drives you insane because it goes round and round and round in your head and never stops. And and so that that was something that was going on at times when I was doing my. I, th I think they're called earworms, and the, my earworm at the moment earworms. is the Goldberg variations. So, what music goes on and on in your head, Marina? <laughs> Do you... uh, uh, it's a difficult yes, but uh, what uh, for sure when it was my first um, uh, time when I was listening to music. Of course, I was very nervous, uh, and it was a rehearsal. It's like an all orchestra, all musicians, and it was my first time to listen to music about our life. And it was very good. It was very touched. It was a very sensitive. And again, I, I almost cried, even it was a, a, even without uh, any movement. And it was really, really good. And I, I was very, very uh, happy in what way it was done. And 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 you you must tell me tell me this. Did you ever meet Putin? No, I've never met Putin, and uh, I have not any regret. But Sasha, <laughs> but Sasha, he uh, actually met Putin. And what just uh, Anthony described, his meeting, Sasha's meeting with the director of uh, FSB slash KGB, it was actually meeting with Putin. Putin was a new uh, director of a security service, FSB, and uh, Sasha tried to explain how corruption started to damage uh, this uh, office and how it's important to make a change. But he talked to a person who was heavily involved in this corruption. And, and, what is the and then he went to prison. Uh, he didn't go straight after that, but mostly it happened now. But then in uh, 1990, uh, uh, 1998, when it was arrested in uh, four months after this meeting. I'm going to go slightly off topic at the moment now because uh, at our um, summer season we've got another Russian opera and it's by Rimsky-Korsakov called Ivan the Terrible. Now most people think of Ivan the Terrible as pretty terrible but um, in fact this particular opera by Rimsky-Korsakov is actually a love story when uh, Ivan the Terrible uh, meets his um, long lost love child and uh, in fact, she gets killed by accident at the end, like most operas, the woman dies. Uh, anyway, so it's, this is a very, very tender piece. Ivan the Terrible has a terrible reputation, but at the moment, Marina, I think he's having a bit of a cleansing in Russia. Uh, it's a very interesting because we have a, uh, maybe it was so far from one event to another one, but we have a very strong link between Ivan Terrible and Josef Stalin. Because it was the first Joseph Stalin who tried to, to make uh, Ivan Terrible as a better person, who tried to unite Russia, who built this, and who made it Russian character is very strong. And now we see exactly the same. And uh, former director of KGB, Nikolai Patrushev, he just recently gave an interview about Ivan Terrible as a great figure of Russian history. Who tried to build as a strong Russia, 
but a West who didn't like it destroyed his reputation. It's unbelievable. And now we have even an uh, initiative to build a new statue of Ivan Terrible. Where? where? Somewhere. It doesn't matter where, but somewhere. Maybe in a, somewhere in Moscow. But it just shows how these people who are in the top of uh, power of Russia, what they minded, what they tried to bring back from this very dark period of history and try to rewrite, try to use all this history. And it's so interesting how it's all happened in the same time. Your your event with this opera and what happened in Russia now. All yes. this has a strong link. Yes. And then, and then tell me the other things that come into my mind are, so Sasha was poisoned in 2006 and then the Skripals were poisoned. When were they poisoned? 2018. Okay, and now Navalny, of course, um, but he managed to get out. So what do you think there are any parallels between these three events? No, we have one very strong link because we uh, blame Russia of doing this. In, uh, in my situation, it took almost 10 years to prove as a Russia behind this crime. And this was public inquiry. Thank you very much, Anthony, just mentioned this. It was extraordinary event. And sometimes I understand people in Russia who rules Russia now, they want to take it in the background. I mean, take it out from attention. They never tried to mention it was proof in a courtroom. It was a public inquiry report. It was a lot of evidence. They even don't like to talk about this. There's always ask, let's go to start a new relationship. Why we do need to think about Skripal? He was a, a betrayer of Russia. But again, it was Litvinenko case in 2006 first. In 2010 was a Skripal. And it was different reaction from then Prime Minister of UK, Theresa May, who said it immediately. He blamed Russia for doing this. And it was using chemical weapon what Russia is supposed to be destroyed, but it looks like never and still even developing this. And now what we have with Alexei Navalny, it's a, another stage of all this, what happened in modern Russian history. It shows no body can say anything different what Putin and all his uh, supporters is saying. There's not any opposition might be existed in Russia. And now Navalny, who is in the prison now, he uh, needs to be supported all around the world. If you want to talk to this about new Russia, you need to support saying freedom of Navalny. And well, um, the incompetence of the people who came to murder Skripal, I mean, the, the, you know, the fact that it went on, went wrong. Let's just go back to when your husband um, Lugovoy actually came to Britain more than once to try and murder um, Sasha, but he didn't. T tell us, tell us about that. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, mention, uh, thankfully, uh, Skripal is alive, and what not only him but his daughter Yulia, they both been attempted to poison, but they didn't die. We don't know what happened to them now, but at least we know they're still alive. Uh, Alexei Navalny survived, and I think he's a hero because he almost died, and he survived, he returned to Russia, and it's uh, awful for what happened to him. But uh, when it's in 2006, uh, Lugovoy tried to approach Sasha, it was much easier for him because he knew, they knew each other. And first meeting happened exactly in 2006 in a, uh, this event of uh, Boris Brezovsky's birthday party. And how all this uh, started, I think, operation developing. Because after this meeting in the end of January and November uh, 2006, it was this uh, almost 10 months. And uh, after public inquiry released this report, and when we saw all evidence, we know Sash was attempted to poison three times. And third time was successful for what who did it and who killed Sasha. 
So, so, so what, one thing when I when I read the book, what's extraordinary is that they keep offering in the book. They keep offering Sasha tea, and he won't drink it. And then he drank it. No, actually, this is a little bit even different because they offered him to drink alcohol. But Sasha uh, was extremely uh, sporty man, and he didn't drink alcohol. And asking to drink alcohol, and when Sasha refused, of course, second question: Would you like to drink tea? And this is was like automatically you you agree. Oh and, what, when, and Sasha took just the two sips, maybe three sips. He didn't drink all tea, but it was just a few, and it was more than enough to kill him. Tony, you say something. <laughs> Yeah, I was just going to say how I've set that scene because it's 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 an important scene in the opera. So they're in the bar of the Millennium Hotel. Um, Ligaboy is there first with his companion and Sasha comes in later and around the bar uh, will be the chorus and, and they sing a sort of murmuring in the background. And then you get uh, at one stage, a sort of jazz type music, like like the typical background music you get in a bar. And it really, I think Sasha has his, his sort of defenses down when, as you say, he gets offered the tea a couple of times. And then eventually, um, Louvois says, look, there's some that needs drinking up, there's still some in the pot. And, and he he takes it, and I almost feel he almost realized after he'd done that that, that 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 was a stupid thing to do, if I may say so. Um, there, there's one very poignant thing at the end of the scene. I'm, I forgot to mention one of the characters is a treble, a boy character, and he plays your son, Tolia, but he also plays a Chechen terrorist, a young, because they were very young, they were teenagers. And, um, sorry, I say a terrorist, a Chechen fighter, a fighter for Chechnya, a young fighter. But in this scene and another scene in the second act, he pays Lugavoy's son, because when Lugavoy, the murderer, came to London, uh, he brought his family to watch this famous football match. And on the way out from the bar, so Lugavoy had just poisoned Sasha with this terrible, terrible poison, polonia. And he says um, to his son, um, uh, here, this is Uncle Sasha, shake his hand. So he gets his son to shake the hand of somebody who, who's got radioactive poison in him. Now, I think it must mean that he didn't know what the poison was that he had, but it's an extraordinary... But, but, but am I right in saying that polonium is only poisonous if it's ingested? Because, of course, Marina spent three days with her husband. It's if it's ingested, but if it's on your clothing, you know, no, if, if it's, it's external and no, you touch no. it, yeah, it's probably a bit like coronavirus <laughs> in that way. Yeah. <laughs> And I've got, I've got some I've got I've got quite a lot of questions coming through, so maybe I could ask you a few. I'm going to start off Tony with one for you from a former colleague called yeah. Neil Curtis, and he says, "When your opera is studied in 20 years' time, in which category will it be seen?" I don't know what he means by that. Does he mean first division or second division? Do you know Neil Curtis? <laughs> <laughs> I definitely know Neil Curtis. I haven't seen him for a number okay, of what, years. What category? I'm, I'm, I'm not quite sure in what category. I mean, this is it's. It's a serious opera. So in the tradition of serious opera, as I say, although it's contemporary, I, I think I've written music that is accessible. It's not extremely challenging music to listen to, I, I hope. But, um, you know, gosh, will it, I, I don't know what people will think of it. This is a strange thing about music. It's been going around in my head all this time, but I have no idea what the world would think of it. But if it's still going in 20 years time, I think the only thing I'd be proud is that it's kept the story of Marina and Sasha in people's minds yeah. in the future. And um, I've got a question for Marie. Well, there's, there's lots of questions here. I've got a question for Marina, which is kind of a bit of a technical question, which is what was Sasha's relationship with Berezovsky? Uh, no, actually, it's quite a long answer, but I will try to make it shorter. They met in 1994, 
when Sasha worked for special uh, investigation because it was assassination of Boris Berezovsky in Moscow when his car was blown up his uh, driver uh, was I think driver was killed and another person was uh, heavily uh, injured and Berezovsky survived and when Sasha started this investigation of this group of people he became more more often uh, meeting Boris Berezovsky and that time it was a professional relationship because Berezovsky was not only a rich person he was working for government and this was like uh, uh, Sasha's duty to look after him but uh, when in 1997 uh, before Sasha was arrested it was a very a serious uh, conflict inside of FSB and uh, because Sasha was asked to kill Berezovsky. It was not like an order, order, but it was a discussion. And what I said already, Berezovsky was uh, a government person. Sasha uh, wrote some statement about this, and this was internal investigation. But because of, uh, of that, Sasha became enemy of people who wanted for some kind of revenge of what happened in Russia in 1991 and this was a lot of people from security service and when Sasha was in prison uh, it was the first time when I met Boris Berezovsky because he uh, just supported uh, our, our family for what happened but nobody believed how far it will go I mean after Putin became president and a lot of people should uh, flow out from Russia and when uh, Sasha escaped, escaped uh, with family, and when we met together in uh, UK, this was kind of a, a friend professional relationship here in UK. Um, and then, of course, Berezovsky, he was one of the people who kind of helped you when you first arrived in the UK. Absolutely. Absolutely. Not only when we arrived, he really uh, supported me uh, after Sasha's death when I was with Anatoly and it was very difficult uh, even to understand what I have to do. And he was uh, uh, very close and uh, very helpful. Um, Tony, here's one for you. How did you get Kit Hesketh Harvey involved? Okay, that, that was through the director, Stephen Mekar. And actually, Stephen, I I'd talked to a number of people about uh, doing the libretto for me and I did start with somebody but it he decided to withdraw so I was desperately looking for the right person and Stephen said oh I think he he's the right person well I, I knew of, of, of Kit and Kit actually as part of the, the Kit and the Widow had played at a birthday party that I'd had about 20 years previously and when Stephen first suggested I my I thought well Kit you know, he only writes very light, light uh, com com comedy things. But actually, it Kit's got a a he he's done a number of things with a Russian angle, and he's got a very serious side. And what I love about the libretto, uh, uh, I've sort of alluded to, it's it's serious, but he's made parts of it sort of light, and that lightness almost makes it even more serious if you saw what i mean and then marina here's a question for you um i remember hearing i think um was sasha's father with him when he died yeah so do you have what well, michael um is asking whether you have fond memories of sasha's father um so do you do, is, do you see sasha's father or is he back in russia this is another story. Uh, I would say is a like an old school KGB. How they try to use relatives in some very serious case against each other. And unfortunately, in 2018, Sasha's father started to blame um, British Security Service of killing Sasha. He turned completely opposite of what he said before. How he tried to explain, like uh, his words saying is a small nuclear bomb killed my my son and it was amazing when he said this but after what happened to him in 2011 
it made me feel very difficult to, uh, to communicate to him because I don't think he wants to communicate to me. He is almost under control of security service. And last his uh, event was on Russian TV 2018 after uh, Sergei and Yulia Skripal attempted to be poisoned. He went to TV to the same show with Andrei Lugovoy, killer of his son, and talking from this stage about uh, British security service, American security service. Mm -hmm. Alexander Goldfarb, who was a very close friend of our family and my co-writer of this book, Death of Dissident. And this is just shows how is this system in Russia fight against us and now, if you're talking about parallels, it's the same system now fight against Alexei Navalny, his family, and his friends. You know, it's a very dangerous story. And you never uh, just need to be prepared and you need to use everything just and to be strong. I, I, I have quite a lot of um, notes coming through on the chat saying that are we worried about our own welfare? <laughs> having a conversation but i think people should have conversations of course they should no first of all uh, i received almost my every interview uh if i'm afraid about my life if i'm worried of what i'm saying what i'm saying you know uh could we be uh okay how to say if uh, two years ago we would be asking about covid and how we need to worry about life Everybody feels just like a surprise. Now everybody worried about their life. And I think we all need to be cautious about our life. But what I'm so happy being here, I can say what I want and what I think. It's my life in a democratic country and I try to use all my rights. Otherwise, I need to go back to Russia and just afraid to speak, afraid to do, or just if I think something, be ready to go to prison. So, I mean, what you've done, Marina, is extraordinary because even though it is, you know, 2006, all these years ago, you have kept Sasha's memory and the terrible situation alive, which I think is very, which is very, very important. But we didn't, Tony touched on, on Anatol Tolia and what, what Tolia now must be a, an adult. Yes, it's a man. It's a not, not a child anymore. Yes, uh, um, in 2006, um, Tolia Anatoly, uh, he was uh, 12 years old. It was a very difficult moment. Uh, everybody who has children knows 12, it's a certain age. It doesn't matter what happened to children. It's a, always some kind of uh, psychological problem. Child became adult. And what happened to An Anatoly, it happened exactly in this age. But uh, it was not easy, it was not smoothly, but I'm very proud of him. And we had a very good relationship and we have a memory of uh, Sasha and we talk a lot, not every day, of course, because it would be abnormal, but uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very, very uh, good between two of us. Uh, uh, it, will he come to the CV opera? I hope so. He still be a little bit um, difficult to see what happened to him from outside. I mean, uh, he was difficult to go to watch play, but he did it. And I saw he was very nervous, but he accepted. I hope it will be the same with opera and with another event, uh, what will be about our life. I hope so. Fantastic. And now, now I've got many, many more. Uh, somebody's asking, do you think things will change in Russia, Tony? Or you're not going to? Do, I? do you think do you think things will change in Russia? One day, one day they will. But I, I have no idea when. And, and did you ever do any business there? I did, yes. Yeah, I went to Russia a few times and I did business there, yeah. Oh, that was a very short answer. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't do so well there, did I? <laughs> and then I've got another contentious one here, but I don't know whether anyone wants to talk about this. Someone saying, this is um, Andrew J saying, does anyone believe that Berezovsky committed suicide? You don't I, I would, no, 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 I, I have a very uh, 
good answer, I believe, uh, because it was an open verdict of uh, uh, his um, inquest. It means we still don't know exactly was he killed or was it uh, 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 he committed suicide. In this case, it's uh, still maybe not enough details. But from my point of view, I don't believe. I believe he was killed. And he was living in Surrey, wasn't he? Uh, it was place where he stayed for last months before he died. Yes, very, very sad. And um, I'm switching slightly out of my questions, just because I feel I have to ask this question. Tony, are you writing another opera? Do I need to get myself ready? <laughs> you do, Waspy. Yeah, yeah, I am writing an opera. Are you going to tell me what to do? Uh, you, is, is it ready for a public? Gosh, well, I think it's, it's, it'll have to be now. Um, <laughs> it's, it's completely different from the first opera, and it's based on Shakespeare. So it's an opera where everyone will know the story, so the music has got to completely carry it. Carry it. Now, there are some twists in the plot, but I'm about halfway through, so watch out, Waspy, I'll be knocking on your door again. <laughs> and, and do you try to compose... Um, do you try to compose a little bit every day? Is it like being an artist and having to practice every day? I do try and do a bit every day, but there's Come different on, sorts of composing. Um, oh, no, it varies. It varies a lot from, from day to day. I mean, there'll be some days where I can do hours and there'll be other days where it's in minutes and there are some days I don't do any at all. But but the, what maybe people don't understand, there's different types of composing. There is the sort of when you start on a work and you do the, out, the skeleton of the work, the very fundamental composing. And then if you're writing into full score, as I do, so technically I, I write all the orchestra parts, the singers and everything at the same time, so let me, which is not... Yeah, explain. It's not the way most composers start with a a piano score for piano and singers and then it's orchestrated later but because of that there's a lot of what, what i spend a lot of time is playing back what i've written listening to it and saying that doesn't feel quite right for, for instance this morning i changed one of the scenes had a certain ending and i decided that wasn't the right ending so i wrote another Ten bars with a different one. But let's be clear, this isn't the life and death of Alexander Litvinenko. This is your new Shakespeare opera. Yes. 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 Very interesting. Sasha told me after we met, he always dreamed to have a, a, a wife who will dance. But he never wanted to dance with me because he was saying uh, it's so difficult to just uh, keep me in his hands and not kissing. You know, it's, it's, it's very difficult for him being close and, uh, uh, and just simply dancing. It was not possible. No, he never danced. But uh, Anatoly was not born yet. And he asked me, Marina, would you like to dance? We can find a partner for you. I'm going to watch you dancing in a competition. But I said, no, 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 no. We finish uh, for, uh, active competitive dancing because now I have uh, a family What I was very happy. And particularly when Anatoly was born and he was just almost one year old. And I started to create special uh, um, activity called dancing with mom and in two uh, in two years i had a, a very big class with the newborn babies with the moms and we have a dancing with moms with a, a lot of variation of different music from latin american to, to russian folk well, i should say just in the opera i mean we follow your the story in the, in the biography i think pretty closely uh, but I took a little bit of license, or Kit did, on the scene. The first time, it's the third scene of the opera, that we meet you on stage. You're at, um, 
Muswell Hill in your apartment. And as you say, it's, it's the day of the poisoning and it's the evening. And it was the sixth anniversary of, of your arrival in the UK. So you were celebrating that. And um, we then get a flashback to how you first met. And it's a dance, I'm afraid. It's a waltz, <laughs> a fast waltz. And I call it the banana waltz because I think you might tell the story that Sasha tried to woo you with bananas, which were very difficult to get in Russia at that stage. This sounds, this uh, sounds like a great, great story. I'm a bit worried about it, actually, the banana story. Um, but I think we've, we've just about reached the end. Of course, I want to thank all of the Telegraph subscribers and all the Grange Park Opera family for joining in. But I especially want to thank Tony and Marina for sharing some very private things with us. Thank you very, very much and good night. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.